welcome all to this pro professional building session. Uh, we have some excellent speakers uh, after me. And um, so uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee and Susan in particular for uh, inviting me to this uh, conference. And as I am part of the uh, organizing committee, I kind of got invited myself. Uh, but I, I really liked uh, that, that I was invited to the uh, organizing committee because I met a, a lot of wonderful people and uh, I've made a, a lot of new friends. And I have one disclaimer that is that uh, Susan asked me to ask some questions during this, uh, you know, at the end of the session so people weren't left alone. But I might have taken that job somewhat too seriously at some time, so I apologize already. So now it's my turn to get up on the stage. Uh, my name is Luc Puy. Uh, I have no uh, credentials behind my name because I don't have any credentials anymore. I was a, a perfusionist in uh, Belgium. Uh, I moved to the United States in uh, 2021. And I also did my last case in 2021 uh, when I left uh, Europe. So I'll be talking about artificial intelligence. Um, not because I'm really an expert in it, but because I am really interested in it. And there's some things that some really uh, exciting things that are coming our way, but they're also spooky or crazy or uh, some right, uh, uh, downright scary. So as a disclaimer, I have no conflict of interest other than that I'm part of the organizing committee. Uh, the beautiful picture of the EKG that you see, I stole it from the, from the United Nations. I hope they can afford it. Uh, but it's literally the, the front page of their uh, latest uh, report on climate change. So uh, I would like to give them credit for that. Uh, and, as, and as I said, I have, I have no uh, real experience other than that I read a lot about artificial intelligence and I, and I think a lot about it. And, um, but I come here on the podium because I always have to think when you have to explain something that you don't know anything about, I have to think about Ricky Gervais. And he's a British comedian. He's the original uh, creator of The Office, the English version, uh, which is, by the way, even more better than, uh, than the US version. And he just said, no one else knows what they're doing. So you might just as well do it yourself. So that's a real good motivator for me. OK, what am I going to talk about today is, uh, is uh, I'm going to set a tone why I think it's important to talk about these things. Uh, I'm going to ex try to explain some things, the, the things I don't understand, give you some examples of what they were already doing, uh, and that is just scratching the iceberg, scratching the surface and, uh, and, and looking at the tip of the iceberg, sorry. Uh, and I'll also look at some dangers and caveats and, and what perfusionists should, should have to do. Uh, and hopefully come to, them, come to t some conclusions, excuse me, uh, but this, this uh, all these things go so fast that probably by the end of my talk, I'm already outdated. Uh, okay, so imagine this. Uh, before I uh, finally settled in the US, I, I attended my first NBA game in, uh, in, in November 2017. And it was uh, the Milwaukee Bucks versus the Memphis Grizzlies. And that is basically all that I remember about it. Because it, I, I still remember that the Bucks won. You know, the, that, that's the only thing I remember, and I was overwhelmed by the experience. And it was, it was magical. We, I come from Belgium. We, our national ba basketball team means nothing. But, you know, and here I am. I'm looking at the NBA. This Jan is doing his magical stuff. Uh, and uh, and I was over, that, that was all that I remember. I knew it was in November. I knew the Bucks won and that they played the, the Memphis Grizzlies. Now, I, I can go back to uh, the NBA website, and they have this neat little page that's called stats. And it's interesting. They do statistics. And I, I see the, the game, and I can finally remember what the score is. You know, And I can see yeah, some things about the, the game, and then there's game details. And I clicked on it, and it's, oh, it's even more information about the game, all the quarters, all the rebounds, and stuff like that. And then at the, at the right side, you see that the PDF, that's just a PDF of this. But then you have a game book, and I'm like, OK, let's, let's see what that is. And that game book is a 16-page uh, document, PDF document, 
that gives you a detailed uh, a account of what happened that, that during that game. And these are the last three minutes, and you can see that, you know, uh, at, at the last minute, uh, Jay Hansen did a rebound. Uh, he passed to Bledsoe. He missed a jump shot from 21 feet. And then uh, M. Gazol took the rebound. And, you know, you can just see everything that happened second by second. And that's crazy, you know. They can give you literally an account of what happened in that, and you can see it. And you can, on their website, you can click on all these events, and they give a video. And of course, it's a MBA, uh, and they do a lot of crazy statistics. Uh, this is where uh, Janis stood when he was scoring. At that time, he didn't do any three-pointers yet. And you can see the percentages of where he was, at what, at what, you know, anything you want to know, you get it there. But of course, there's a lot of money, and a lot of people interested in MBA. So let's let's go to Perfusion. Um, last year, uh, I'm subscribed to the Perfusion Improvement Reporting System from the Australia, New Zealand uh, College of Perfusion. And they have the, the PERS2, the safety uh, uh, reporting system. And they, they send you emails with reports. And this was a report about an air MLI alarm. Uh, the, the pump stopped, the clamps were going on. Uh, they looked, at, there was no air to be detected, but so they decided to carry on and then the, the arterial pump didn't work anymore. So they started hand cranking. Luckily there was an N plus one, so they could change out very rapidly. Uh, I think the, the patient only suffered like 37 seconds of, uh, of no flow during that and the patient was alive and well and everyone was having a beer afterwards, except for the patient probably, and they call it a good catch, no harm incident. But this have, could have gone really, really bad. You know, you, luckily they had an N plus one, luckily there was a pump in the room, a spare pump according to the, gui to the standards and guidelines, so the patient was alive and well and, and, and that's why we have these documents. But these people wanted to know what had happened, you know, the, these machines cost $250,000 and they don't do what they are doing, what they are supposed to do. So they send it back to the factory. It's, it's not important what pump it was, it's, it's just uh, the, the principle of it. And so they, they looked at the data and the company simply said, nothing happened. We, we cannot find these issues back. Uh, there's no data, the data is corrupted. Maybe you took it out, I, we don't know. But we cannot trace back this incident. So a patient potentially died and we cannot see what happened afterwards. And that is scary. So what I want to say is we, we perfusionists, we have to go in, uh, to the next industri industrial revolution, which is already happening uh, for a long time. So first we had steam, we started factories, then we had electricity, we started really, really mass production. The third uh, revolution was automated production by computers. Computers started helping us. And then computers started uh, connecting to each other, and that was the fourth revolution. It's the, it's the artificial intelligence, uh, robots becoming more uh, involved in humans and, and vice versa. And so, sorry, what are you talking about? Artificial intelligence, I don't know what that is. It's, it's, it's something. And I have some definitions to throw, in it, to throw at you. So the artificial intelligence is, is the whole thing. We try to create intelligent machines, which are basically computers. And they, we want to let them work like the human brain. So it's, it's the science, it's the hardware. And one of the parts is a neural network. It's basically you try to make software that works like neurons, that put things together and starts talking to each other and, and, and connect things. So it's the brains. One of those types of neural networks is deep learning. And that's where it gets more interesting even. And so that, that means that uh, you, you throw a lot of data to this system and it starts learning how to uh, associate things. So for example, if you would uh, throw perfusion data, it, it would say, oh, these patients, they have a low hematocrit. I don't, the machine doesn't know what it is, but it just knows low hematocrit. There's a subset of patients that have a low hematocrit, and there's a high prime volume. And then at the end, they have a low uh, hematocrit to come off of this thing, a pump. I don't know what it is, but... And then these people are more likely to die. 
And then the output would be that patients with low hematocrit and a high prime volume are more likely for mot mortality. And that's how, how these machines work very, very simplified. So it, this is the thinking. A subset, again, is machi machine learning, <coughs> and that's where the, the machines basically start thinking about, uh, for themselves. They, you don't have to learn them anymore, but you just throw data at it, and it's, and it's going to do something with it, and you have an outcome. And this is the, the creepy thinking, of course, because this is where you get into your car, and the, suddenly your car uh, tells you it takes you 15 minutes to get back home. Okay, I didn't ask for it, but the machine told me, so maybe it's true. And then there's another thing that's called lang natural language processing, and that is where it tries to recognize speech or what you write. Sometimes I, I think it's, it's trying to understand what I'm thinking, uh, but I, I remember I was at the MSEC meeting uh, last, uh, a few weeks ago, and there was a session about um, uh, what we're going to talk about, <coughs> oh, sorry, what we're going to talk about later of non-technical skills. And I didn't talk about non-technical -te skills, I just watched uh, some presentations about it. And I went on LinkedIn a few days later and I got an ad for, uh, to go study somewhere about non-technical skills. Hmm, strange. So this is really spooky. And it becomes spo more, even more spooky when baby's first words are, are going to be Alexa instead of mama and papa. And that is a true story and it's more and more. So, you know, just crazy stuff. And I, I don't, I'm not sucking this out of my thumb. I, I, I read this uh, really interesting book uh, by Eric Topol, uh, Deep Medicine, and he talks about uh, the possibilities that are there and, and, the, and the things we can learn and, and, and that are going to happen. And this book was written in 2018, and I read it last year, and it was already outdated. Like the, the, the examples he gave of, of deep learning and, and machine learning and, and, and what you can do with it, it's already outdated. Um, but not the, the way he thinks about it, the ethical thinking about it. So he, he basically says that we don't need to go to machine medicine. The, the machines don't need to replace uh, people but the machines will need to help us. They, they should be a, a, a way to help us to be more human and to be more centered towards the patient. You know, and this is, this is the unique opportunity we have to, do, to use now to be more human to our patient. Uh, and they say to, go to bring back real medicine, maybe real perfusion. I don't know what that is, but it sounds good. But, you know, we have to gain trust from our patients and we have to be aware that, that these uh, things are happening. And, and I was talking about outdated uh, yeah. knowledge. Uh, I read a report in, from 2011 and they said that in the, f in the 1950s, it was estimated that all medical knowledge was doubled in the next 50 years. It was going to be doubled in the next 50 years. And then in, in 1980, it was estimated that the, the doubling of medical knowledge was going to happen in the next seven years. Well, guess how, how, many, how much time does it take now to double the, the medical knowledge? It's 73 days. So that means that if you're starting medicine now, by the time you graduated, you only have around 6% of all the medical knowledge. It's just something to think about. That is, that is how fast it goes. And that's creepy. So I, I have this vision about how perfusion should, what perfusion should do, and it's, uh, it's in the, the ideal world, and it's, uh, I think you always set, su should set your goal to uh, world dominance, and then see where you get, and start from there. And we have all these nice uh, heart-lung machines, and they get information from all the, the EKGs and the patient monitors and, and, and the cell savers. And from, from the bottom, you see all the services from the hospital. It's the, the EMR and the, the bedside, the lab, the, the medication, diagnostics and blood bank, and ev all, that, all that gets fed into, into a central database. The, it's, it's controlled for uh, um, 
privacy issues and quality control. There's a feedback mechanism uh, that tells you, well, this line of data is not correct. Maybe you should reconsider uh, submitting it. It's, it's going through the, process, through the processor, and we have a nice data house uh, full of perfusion data and outcomes. And this you can use to, to make reports, reports for your own, for your team, for your center. You can benchmark it against the rest of the world. Uh, you can use it to train, to recertify, uh, and, and, and look how well you are doing. And then we can have uh, in the second uh, quadrant, uh, on, on a lower quadrant, you have all the, the databases starting talking to each other, so the people in Australia know how they're doing against the rest of the world, or the people in Europe. And we can write clinical guidelines with this and feed it back to the, to the machines for clinical dis decision support. Uh, we can do clinical trials. Al was talking about, uh, or David was talking about using uh, uh, clinical trial registries to, to make guidelines, and then we can use it for teaching and simulation. And some of this stuff is already happening, or, or we are talking about and thinking about doing, and, and it's really exciting, but to do this, we, we first of all need a, to be able to let them communicate with each other, so we need a common perfusion language, and I will come back to that later. And we need to use, and I, I say we need to use artificial intelligence and deep learning, but what I really say is we need to embrace the power of, of computer processing that is, that is there, and we should use it to, to the good of the patient, not to the good of us, or not to the good of the computers, or not to, to show uh, how, how well we can do it, but to help the patient. So what, what can we do with this? Like clinical decision support, that is the, the, the timely information given to you in the context of what you're doing. And then, I'm not an expert in that, but uh, Mr. Paul, uh, our good friend, he, he talks about this, he's busy with this, and, and his colleagues and, and companies he's involved with are already doing this. Uh, for example, you get reminders that you, have to, that you have to give something, you know, it's 20 minutes since your last cardioplegia. That, that sounds simple, but we have to use it. It's to our advantage. Um, order set, uh, displaying patient information, uh, you're going to give this, your patient is allergic to that. So don't give it. That should be maybe at not in a heart lung machine, but at the dispensers of medication. You go get medication for a certain patient, and that machine tells you, "I'm not giving that to you because he or she is allergic to it." You know, safety and quality issues. Anything that a machine can tell you that you don't have to think about because you got stuff to do. Okay, and an example of this, it's already happening. This is not artificial intelligence of, of mach or machine learning. It's just using a computer to the good for the patient. And this is a group of five uh, hospitals that are doing patient blood management. And they, uh, whenever someone uh, ordered a bag of blood, they get this message and they say, uh, according to these guidelines, you only have to give blood when the, when the, uh, the hemoglobin is below seven grams. And your patient, last patient, your last hemoglobin was 12 on this patient. Why are you giving this blood? And then he can either say, oh, I'm, I'm making a mistake. Maybe I, this patient doesn't need blood. Or he can say, well, he just jumped off a building and it's bleeding, so I really need that blood. And then you can justify it and we can discuss it later. But this will help you save, well, it helped this hospital to save money and two million dollars a year is not bad, I would say. So that's, that's a, a big return on investment, 400%. What, what else can we do is automate pro procedures. We have now heart lung machines that can initiate heart uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, wean cardiopulmonary bypass, but we still need that human touch, of course. We, we should not let machines decide when it's time to get off bypass, but they can help us in our decision making. There's a, uh, an article that, that describes how when you start going down on your flow, there's a little prompt on your, on your screen that says, maybe you should wake up the anesthesiologist to start ventilating the patient or get him off his phone. Sorry, <laughs> no offense. Uh, use of checklists, you know, you're going down on flow, are you weaning? Okay, here's a checklist for weaning. 
and and maybe the the machine can already tell you yes your potassium is good yes your 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 ventilation is on yes your you are on 100% FiO2 so these checklists it's always like ah the checklist no the the machine can tell you that the checklist is half is already half full you know warning all the algorithms you know uh, this is like this is where the machine learning comes in a certain situation is evolving and the machine thinks that in this situation maybe in five minutes your patient there will be an event happening so it it's probably it's it's going to need a lot of data to do this but it's just just imagine that it would be nice and then also medication warnings training and ev evaluation and risk prediction i'm going to talk about this a little little bit more and then evidence for guidelines as i told you the 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 knowledge of the medical knowledge is is uh, doubling every 73 days now we just can't keep up you know and and uh al slammed us with with a, a big wad of articles this morning and we we still cannot decide if hemofiltration is is good or bad so we need we need we can use the help of computers to read those articles for us and there are already uh, websites doing that so i i said predicting uh, of survival so this is about patients after ecmo and they used uh, <coughs> excuse me they used uh, the retrospective data of 280 patients a massive load of data points 1.92 million uh, data points a lot of lab values that, that from the first 48 hours of ecmo runs and the machine could predict in 82 percent uh, if the patient was going to die or not on on ecmo and that was a higher performance than the safe two score but luckily this was only a proof of concept because they had a limited number of data points they they didn't take everything into consideration it was a retrospective data and it it certainly needs validation because what are you going to do when you put your patient on ecmo and after two days the machine says no you know computer says no you this patient is going to die you have to stop it because it's it's useless it's foot futile are you going to do it or what what if he says you have 10 patients and 8.9 percent so 89 percent of those patients are going to die or are going to live what are you going to do with the other 1.1 patients you know these are, this is stuff that we have to think about are we going to use this to to decide for us or are, are we going to just use it as as one of the things we have to consider when we are putting a patient on ecmo so the limitations of this study and this is very important to know that you have a massive amount and i will show you a picture that that makes it more clearer you have a massive amount of data that you put into the machine and the machine does something with it but it's literally called the hidden layers and so it makes all these associations but what if you put the postal code of these patients into their uh, into that machine is, does it matter maybe maybe they live next to a a, uh, a a network of pipes that are made of lead so they have a less chance of survival but it's literally a black box we don't know what the machine does and it, when it spews out your results then you have to think about these results and and try to figure out what the machine did and that's literally what they said in this article and this is about ecmo what are we going to do about missing data quality of data the more variables you have the more data you need these machines love to eat data the more you give them the, the, the more accurate they become but then it it now it's about perfusionists we're, we're going to use a machine uh, to learn it, how to predict how perfusionists are going to react to a certain situation. Wait a minute. <laughs> is this, this is a bit more scary. Are we going to be replaced by, by machines? Probably never. But it's just something, ju I'm just throwing it at you to think about. So this was a simulated, not a clinical situation, but a, a simulated clinical situation your patient has a low DO2 for a certain reason in a certain setting. But there were two perfusionists sitting at a computer and they got this information and then they had to make a decision. So it's, that was also a limitation of the study. So we have five possible decisions. 
Uh, one was going down on your flow for uh, the, probably for the reason that one of the situations that that could happen was that you your cannula was kicked, kinked, the line, the venous line was kinked, so you would go on lower flow to resolve that situation, uh, of course. And then another situation, wa uh, another uh, possibility was to to just wait and, and see what happens and, and evaluate the situation. Uh, evaluate the situation, not doing anything but telling the surgeon, uh, give blood, I think, was uh, or tra transfuse or uh, hemoconcentrate. And they used two perfusionists and 148 simulations and they could predict with a almost 80% accuracy what the perfusionist was going to do. Of course, this, this is a very limited proof of concept but it can be used later in clinical decision support. Um, so it was only two perfusionists. You, you need lots of more and more data. Uh, there's no clinical setting. There's no, uh, no surgeon uh, asking you what are you doing. Uh, and, and there's a limited number of possible reactions, of course. It's, it was just to see what they could do with this machine. But I'm showing you this because uh, we are going to have to deal with this. This is the algorithm that they used. And I really <laughs> have no idea what they're talking about. There's, there's some sums in it and then domains and, and, and real numbers and, you know, but they are going to throw this at you at some, at some point, you know, at some day it's going to come into your OR and this is going to decide how you are going to react. Uh, and, and Mr. Diaz, who, who presented at MSEC, is one of the good guys. I can assure you, he, he knows what a perfusionist is. And, and this is uh, aptly called the confusion matrix. It's just a, a, a on, on the right, on the left side, you have the perfusionist action and the predicted action by the computer. And the bluer it gets, the more accurate the prediction. So doing nothing was a really good prediction. So. How about profiling? But anyway, it's it's. I think this is this kind of research is necessary, but we have to be aware that it's there and that and that and that it's going to happen. So I said it might be useful clinical decision support, like you know this situation is happening, and I know that perfusionist is sitting behind my behind the pump. I should warn him because this perfusionist is not always paying attention, and the machine knows that. Because uh, one of the one of the things was that if the machine knew who was behind the pump, it could better predict the action. So the the machine knows you. That's some we it's it might be scary, but we need to take it to our into our advantage. It's a it's a help for us, but it needs way more input and validation in a clinical setting. And then we can use it for training. You know, the, the, the power of computers and, and new technology. Uh, we can do virtual reality training with augmented multi-sensory cues. And this was a, a study in, in which there were three groups of people. One had no uh, accessories, no help, no help from computers. Another group had uh, goggles on with, with virtual reality and augmented uh, reality so they could see stuff and, and uh, when it changed color it was a thing that they had to grab and, and use to perform the action and then the third group they had the goggles on and also gloves and there were auditory, s auditory signals and the, the gloves vibrated when they took something bad they were like that's not what you need okay I need something else and then they did a few training sessions and then they had five attempts to, to do something, to perform a task. And the, the dark red is the, the no help group. And you can see that even after five trials, the augmented reality group still did a better job. And that is the adv making, taking advantage of the new technology. And I kind of fooled you because this was to uh, replace a tire in a, in a car. But it's, this is used by perfusionists as well. There's a group in Germany that uses uh, eye tracking glasses and they can see where students are looking at during a pump run. And it's still in simulation, but this could be used in, in, uh, in a clinical setting as well. Just to know what is distracting you. Are you looking at your phone? Is there a nurse that is uh, talking to you? Is there something else happening? Are you actually looking at the screen or do you have to 
uh, be aware of where everything else is, and they, they literally can see and, and, and uh, look, uh, look where you are looking. More computer power, I just wanted to share you with this. This is in Grenoble in France, in France and uh, uh, at the French Alps. And the circle you see in the middle of the island is, is actually an RX machine, a, a really huge uh, uh, CT scan, to be honest. And it's a, it's a particle accelerator. It's about half a mile long. And they make pictures of, they make beautiful pictures. And I just wanted to share you to, to see how the computer power can help us. And this is the kind of images they make. Uh, these are the kidneys of, the 90, of a 94 year old donor. Uh, and you can go up to 20 nanometers with this new technology. So you can literally look at cells. And I just wanted to share with you the, these beautiful images uh, that we can use to our advantage. This is a, a lung of a patient that died of COVID. And the, the, the researchers that are doing this, well, that are using this uh, technology, uh, they wanted to look at lungs of COVID patients that, have, that had died and, and those that had not died. And they could show actually that, that COVID is, is more of a vasculature vascular problem than a, than a uh, pulmonary problem because your, your uh, vasculature gets really attacked by the virus in, in, and this was in the first wave. So, but these are beautiful images. Look at this, the heart of the 94 year old and they can literally, the, there is so much data. I think one image takes a few terabytes, uh, which is incredibly uh, a lot, which is more than your computer that you have every day. Uh, but they can they can literally fly through the brain and go to a certain spot in the brain and look at the cells, which is actually really cool. But what do uh, perfusions need to do? Uh, how are we going to make sense of all that data and make sure we tell a nice story with it? Because that's the ultimate goal. I think we're still in the in the first uh, first two phases. We we have a lot of data and we know what we're uh, doing, but we we need to work with this. So first we need to do electronic charting and we so I think that is a no brainer. We have to do that because we have to own our data. If you don't have data, you cannot tell anybody what you're doing in your practice. Uh, we need a perfusion EMR. We are also working on that and there are a lot of uh, new EMRs coming out, which is very exciting. Uh, we need to learn about it. So we need people who are uh, not only uh, versed in, in perfusion, but also in statistics and, and, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, and, and research, clinical research or uh, basic research, and also who are versed in, in informatics and, and actually be data scientists. And then we need to find a way to, to, to make sense of the reporting, what comes out of all this, of this data and uh, put it into guidelines and clinical decision support. I was talking about speaking one language. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of vendors, uh, which is not a problem. But if you're going to do research and you want to know what the mean arterial pressure at a certain point is, you can. There's a lot of ways to say what the mean arterial pressure is, and this this is an example. But there's a pediatric data uh, consortium that is trying to. Uh, that is not trying, they are successfully in, in uh, creating a common language about pediatric cancer. And they, f they did this because they found that there were 57 ways to give the patient's age uh, in data. So just, just uh, to make sure that they ever, all the data is correct and, and the same, so that when we feed it into the, into the machine, into the, into the learning, that we all talk about the same thing. This is just an example. You know, all the EMRs can be different, but when they give data to registries, we have to talk the same language and then feed it into the machine. And there are uh, languages uh, to, to be used at, but we have to learn them. Okay, so the perfusion data scientist, I'm almost there. Uh, we have to build an, an artificial intelligence competent surgical workforce, the surgeons say. The anesthesiologists say we need an anesthesiologist informatist informaticist and I told you about the three things that they should know well I, I do the I do put a claim on the perfusion data scientist you can call it whatever you want but a, a, a perfusionist who is knowledgeable in, in yeah, that doesn't work 
in not only in perfusion, he has to be, you know, know what a perfusion does, perfusion is does, but he also has to be in maths and statistics. We have a lot of masters, and now there are already some people who know a lot about computer science. Also, be critical. This is an artist that took uh, 99 used cell phones, iPhones, and he dragged them ac across the streets in Berlin in a little cart, and he, there was no traffic anymore behind him. He did, maybe it was a Sunday, and he went onto a bridge, and his goal was to create a traffic jam. And there were, all the cars were deviated because all their cell phones said, hey, watch out, there's a traffic jam uh, on the bridge over the River Spree in, Be in Berlin. And he wanted to, to show you that, you know, the, that artificial intelligence and machine learning is already being used by Google, Facebook, all these algorithms, and, and they show you a picture that isn't there, you know? And they, it's, it's, it's not supervised. Google tells you there's a traffic jam, but there isn't a traffic jam because it's not supervised. You cannot supervise this. It's too big, there's too much data, and we have to be careful about that. This is the same techniques that tell 16-year-old girls on Instagram that they have to look a certain way because the algorithm shows them. So that's, it's dangerous. Or it's Facebook telling you who to vote for. So this is the, the, the concept of deep learning. You, you put a lot of data in it. It's, it's called hidden layers. Uh, they, the machine does something with it, and I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but we have to, if you don't know anything about these algorithms, then you don't know what the machine does. And, and we have to be careful what, what the machine is thinking. And this is Hal from Space Odyssey. People that are old enough and, and like Stanley Kubrick, they will know what I'm talking about. Also, we have to be equitable uh, in, in using that uh, data. This is just an example where uh, in the algorithm to decide who needed money for uh, healthcare, the the fact that people spent less, that black people, sorry, spent less on healthcare, made the algorithm think that they need less care because they s they don't spend enough money on it, and so we have to make sure that that doesn't happen when we when we are deciding to use machines. And there's more and more, and I'm almost there now. Uh, this is more and more coming into. We, we see more and more of these articles, a healthy debate. You know, we, we know what it is now. Now we have to talk about it and, and decide how we are going to use it. And this is an article where they, it comes from the, the Netherlands. And they, they asked uh, many uh, medical doctors questions, uh, it was a series of 47 questions on the, on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And, and uh, so they, they say it's helpful, you know, but let the physicians do what they're trained for. And then rules and regulations are crucial. You know, private companies are, are all about it, uh, about the money. I don't think that's completely true, but there's some truth in it. You know, if you're a company, you need to be sustainable. So we, we need to think about that. Um, okay, so my conclusions, which are already outdated, maybe not for perfusion. So perfusion must enter the fir fourth industrial revolution. That's, and I say must enter, but I think we're already knocking at the door, but we just don't know it. Or it's already, in fact, if perfusion is a house, the artificial intelligence is already in your cellar. And we're, there's a lot of exciting, scary, and, and stuff coming coming to you, and I've talked to a lot of people on this conference, and and it's coming. They're doing it. It's and it it might be in a few weeks or next year, and we'll talk about uh, other stuff, I guess. So, but what we need for that is huge amounts of data. You know, we need to, we need to know how to collect this. We need we need uh, the devices need to talk to each other. And, and we need to collect uh, vast amounts of data, and we need to know how, how to interpret that in a, human, in a human way and for the good of the patient. So we need an ethical, professional discussion. And I would like to thank you uh, for your attention.